Perfect. Thank you, Adam, and everybody who is here today. Um, I will try to be quick for the sake of time, but uh, feel free to ask questions through the chat. Uh, so my name is Javier Diaz. I'm a computational biologist. I studied back in Mexico. Uh, my PhD on uh, biochemistry and computational biology, and then I moved to Canada about 15 years ago. I uh, spent a fair number of years in the academic sector at the University of Toronto, doing research on um, different types of data, but mainly focus on finding new antibiotics to fight diseases uh, produced by bacteria. Then uh, about five years ago, I moved to a consortium of hospitals that we have here in Toronto called University Health Network. One of the hospitals is called Princess Margaret Hospital, which specializes on cancer. And I started working with more um, bigger volumes of information and different types of measurements that I want to talk a little bit in the next slide. And three years ago, I switched gears to the industry in a biotech startup called Phenomic AI. Um, again, doing research on the field of um, cancer. So uh, before I tell you about what we do at Phenomic, I have this Venn diagram where I try to summarize what, in my opinion, a data scientist uh, does, uh, in particular in um, health sector. But in general, I will say any data scientist and also why I think being a data scientist is great and is very transferable between sectors, between fields of research or um, different industries. So I always picture data scientists to have to be people who have uh, at least two of these three components, these two or these three circles, one being in the top, the maths and stats knowledge. You don't have to be a mathematician or a statistician, but it's expected that you have fair amount of knowledge about maths and stats. Second, uh, in the bottom uh, left part, um, it's great that because you are going to be dealing with big volumes of data, and of course you don't want to do this manually, you want to tell a computer how to process that information for you. So you need to have computer science knowledge. Coding in R, Python are good things to go um, in terms of data scientists. And then the intersection between these two things, maths and stats and computer science is what we can call machine learning in a way. And then the third component, which I have here in the, in the bottom right part, is the domain knowledge or the business knowledge. In my case, I'm a biologist and I know about uh, human health, but it can be uh, different depending on the sector where you are. It can be finances if you are in the banks or other type of knowledge that you will bring to the table. Uh, and I think these three aspects are super important, but also the first two being uh, uh, aware of maths and stats and computer, computational sciences. If you're equipped with these two, at least strong knowledge of one of them, then the domain knowledge can be different and you can transition between these uh, sectors saying, uh, I know a fair amount of people who transition from engineering to health sciences or from health sciences, they go to the banks because the domain knowledge um, is important, but for technical aspects, the other two are more important. Now, when you become kind of more senior in, in a position, then the domain knowledge starts to become stronger and stronger. And probably the, one of the main contributions that data scientists will do to their organizations is more on the domain knowledge part of things. Um, perhaps the more um, entry level or junior team members will work more on the technical aspects of the other two, the machine learning, coding, etc. And then as time passes, the domain knowledge is going to become more and more important and is going to be your kind of signature that you bring to the table in uh, strategic planning for a given product or a given new uh, implementation that you're doing. In general, what does uh, data science need to have, in my opinion? First thing is being curious, uh, being analytical. So all those years that we spend in the academia or working in the academic labs are critical in the sense of making an, good analytical thinking. Um, as I mentioned, knowing maths, coding is, is a must. Sometimes I have 
friends who might ask me, I want to become a data scientist, but I don't know how to code. Do I need to know how to code? Yes, you need to do it because you are going to tell the computer to do things for you. It's not only to do it faster, it's also to do it in a systematic way that is reproducible and that others who come after you can figure out why you did these things in a certain way rather than doing everything manual. Um, then next point, very, very important, domain knowledge. Don't take this for granted. Often we have applicants uh, who apply for a given position. They are very good at the technical aspects. They code very well, etc. But they might be lacking domain knowledge. And often we end up deciding between two or three applicants based on their domain knowledge. How do you get the domain knowledge? Reading, reading about specific topic of interest. I'm interested in cancer, so I read about cancer. I play around with data that is public with cancer data sets. And so that gets me uh, that gets me knowledge about the domain. Some extras for those who are looking more into more se kind of senior roles is uh, management skills. Uh, some point people might be handling small groups or small teams or bigger teams. So having management skills, and I know in the software development um, um, teams, we have Agile, we have other tools that allow us to handle um, uh, human resources or um, team members. And then storytelling, having the ability to present your results to audiences that are not necessarily technical, or even more when they are mixed technical and not technical. So you have to be able to often present at a level that everybody can understand, but also that is not trivializing your results, that you are giving enough credit to your discoveries. Um, in the bottom right part are, um, is my email, but also feel free to reach out to me by LinkedIn. I will post it in the, in the next minutes. So talking about um, the next slide, thank you. Um, this is the type of data that we work with at Phenomic. Phenomic is a biotech startup based in Toronto and Boston. And we use a type of measurement that is called single cell RNA sequencing. So I'm going to explain what does that mean. Um, everybody has the same number of genes um, in all the cells and they are the same genes, everybody. But some of those genes are turned on or off, depending, for example, the tissue type that we are that we have. If it's skin, some of those 30,000 genes are turned on and some others are turned off. If it's a um, lung um, cell or tissue, some other different genes are turned on and off. So that turning on and off of the genes is what we call RNA. So it's the expression of the genes. And then finally, that RNA is uh, passed to something that is called a protein, which is what actually will do the work. But that intermediate messenger between the entire list of 30,000 genes and all the possibilities that we can create in terms of proteins is what we call mRNA or RNA. So there are very powerful techniques that have been uh, invented, that were invented more than 20 years ago, where, for example, in this figure, I'm representing a cancer patient. So when the cancer patients go to the surgeon, they might take samples from their tumors, from their biopsies, and they will send those uh, samples to be sequenced. And often they will sequence not only, or they will de determine whether the, the genes turn it on and off in the tumor, but also they will sequence the tissue that is adjacent to the, to the tumor. So we can compare healthy tissue versus cancer tissue. And the way this used to be done was taking the average of all the cells in a given biopsy. That used to be the way to do things until 2015. Um, during the last 10 years, we have developed uh, as a community um, very powerful experimental techniques that now can measure the expression of each of these 30,000 genes on each individual cell within a given sample. So if you think about um, in terms of data analysis, instead of having a matrix of rows where the rows are the genes and columns where the commons are, where the columns are the patients, now we have thousands or millions of matrices where the rows are still the genes 
and the columns are still the patients, but now each matrix represents one single cell, if that makes sense. So we have like kind of a 3D, um, 3D volumes of data, which it scales things up uh, to a resolution that we never uh, have seen before. Uh, in fact, these methods have been named uh, by this journal Nature Methods, which is one of the leading uh, journals in, the, in, in science, in the scientific field. Uh, these methods have been named in three different years, uh, method of the year. They are very powerful. And that's the type of information that we work with. It's very important because it gives us a resolution um, at very good scale. It can tell us, for example, a certain patient, if he's responding to a treatment or not, and not only if he's responding, but also which cells are in charge of that response. Whereas before we couldn't distinguish that between different, different um, cell types. It's as if you come to a city and you ask someone, hey, what is the average uh, language that you guys speak here? Or what's the average skin color of people here? With the average, you don't really answer and you don't take into account all the diversity or the ethnicity diversity that we have in a city like Toronto, right? So rather than taking the averages, we rather measure every single cell. And then you can have a much better picture about the diversity that happens within the tumor microenvironment. All right, so what is my role at Phenomic and my team's role in the next slide? We develop um, web application like this one where we, we pre-compute using machine learning and deep learning and bioinformatic technologies. Um, we pre-compute all the integration of big volumes of information uh, generated across um, different labs, different um, organizations around the world. We put them all together. We standardize it so that we can run different machine learning tasks. Um, for example, sometimes people might call a T cell, which is a type of cell responding to, um, to uh, diseases, might call it in a different way, depending on the laboratory where it was measured, but we know that they mean the same. It's the same thing, just with a different name. So we standardize all these different namings and conventions in a way that can be used for machine learning purposes um, and people can run the, bench, the benchmark analysis, et cetera. And we make this type of graphic user interfaces for our users who are usually biologists who don't have a computational background or clinicians who don't have a computational background. So our end users are people who don't need to worry about having software dependencies uh, issues or computational power. All what they need is a web uh, browser, Chrome or any other web browser, where they will they will click here and there, and they will ask questions. For example, here on the on the left side, you see that uh, red, uh, sorry, that uh, yellow um, dot that says um, ECM fibroblast. Um, if you see there is a, a header that says cancer, and then the normal is not yellow; is is kind of greenish. That means that that particular gene out of those 30,000 is super highly expressed in cancer samples, but not in the normal tissue samples. So if you were to develop a new drug against cancer or a new treatment against cancer, this particular gene might be a good candidate because it's highly expressed in cancer cells, but not in normal tissue cells. So people who, who might want to identify new potential targets against cancer can use our tool and can go and ask questions about give me some genes that might be good candidates for breast cancer or for colorectal cancer or for a specific subtype of can breast cancer, et cetera. And the other thing that we do is that, um, so this is all ready to go for people just to click here and there. Um, and the other thing that we do is that we allow the user to use their own data. People is producing data all the time. And uh, we have our pre-trained models through machine learning or deep learning. So the most uh, time consuming and computational expensive steps is the training um, in, uh, of these algorithms. But once we have the model trained, uh, we don't need to do it again. So we allow them to compare their own new data, say 
clinician in or surgeon in a given hospital has a new patient and they have access to sequence the RNA of that patient and they can uh, align it against, against our model with our tool and tell um, the patient if a given treatment might be good for them or not given a certain gene of interest. So certain treatments are going to be good for certain types of patients, but not for all of them. So this type of tool is meant to help decision makers and um, uh, basic science researchers to take decisions about whether a given gene is a good target or it might be a good target or not. Of course, we have uh, a phenomic. The other nice thing is we have this computational side of things, but we also have experimental side of things where we pass these lists of new genes to our um, experimental folks and they will do they will develop antibodies against those targets and then test them in animal models to see if actually a given tumor um, is diminishing their volume with time or not. Um, that's that's in a nutshell uh, what we do at Phenomena, what I've been doing. And maybe we go back to um, to the first slide just to, to wrap things up. Um, the, um, uh, uh, Adam, can we go back to the first slide? Thank you. Um, so just to wrap things up, um, we are, at Phenomic, we are taking um, the machine learning methods, in particular deep learning, to integrate big volumes of information. And the domain knowledge that we're adding is the knowledge of cancer biology. Um, so um, anyone who might be interested in um, more about what I've been doing and what Phenomic uh, is doing, um, um, feel free to reach out to me through LinkedIn or, or by email. And I'm happy to answer questions if we have time.